Well, this is a much sunnier scene than last week. I'm back in Australia, back in the sunshine. It is 32 degrees at the moment, Celsius as well, not the cold one. So this is, this is a really, really nice change for a moment. It's not gonna last long, but I will get back to that a little bit later on. So uh, I'm back in Oz, uh, back just for a little while, and there has been a bunch of interesting stuff happening this week, as well as an, just an epic, ridiculous experience, which led to a big blog post and all sorts of other things. But first things first, uh, a couple of little things this week worthwhile talking about. One is that we have announced NDC Melbourne. So NDC is coming, well NDC has been in Australia for quite a while. We've been doing NDC Sydney for years. We've been doing NDC Security, which has been on the Gold Coast for a while. In 2020, we're going to be doing it on Melbourne. Now many of you, I know, know NDC for me. Going to Oslo and doing NDC in 2014 was my first one was always like the, the pinnacle. Like if I could get there, it'd be amazing. And, and that was the, the start of a, a massive shift in my career as well. So always been a very special event for me. Gonna have two of them in Australia this year. We're still gonna have Sydney later on in the year. Melbourne is going to be on the 27th to the 30th of July this year. So I've seen a lot of tweets about people in Melbourne. I'm very happy about that. If you're down this part of the world, you'll be able to catch us there. So that's super cool, that is coming. Uh, actually, while I'm on the NDC things, next week, hang on, where are we? No, the week after next is NDC security. So I'm actually going to be back in Oslo for that. That's why the sunshine here is not going to last long. So I'll be doing NDC security in a couple of weeks, and I will also be doing NDC London after that. So I'm going to be back at London also later in the month. So doing a lot of the NDC things at the moment. Now, that's it on the uh, conferency bits and pieces. Let's move on to other things this week. Now, just this morning, I put out two polls, which I thought were very interesting. And these are polls about passwords. And, and what I was curious about is, do we have more passwords, fewer passwords, or the same number of passwords as we did 10 years ago? And what do we project in the future? And, and the reason why I ask this, is for some reason someone linked to an old blog post of mine from 2011 about how people choose passwords. And I was thinking, you know, back then, we were continually having this discussion about will passwords still exist in like 10 years from now? And a whole bunch of people were like, nah, 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 like passwords will be gone in 10 years or we'll have less. So I put out the question. Now, <laughs> here's the first bit. Compared to 10 years ago, do you have less passwords of course, some people say it should be fewer passwords. I don't know. I'm Australian. You're really looking to me for to be the pinnacle of grammar. Less passwords, you know what I mean. Same number of passwords or more passwords. 4% of people have less passwords today. I did notice some people actually said that there was a, they accidentally chose the wrong option. 4% uh, of people also have, same number, also 4%, have the same number of passwords. 92% of people, this is after about 4,400 votes at the moment, actually have more passwords than they did 10 years ago. I sure as hell do. And to be clear as well, I, I probably could have phrased this better. Because people said, do you mean, like do I just have the same password in the past and I just reused it everywhere and now I have like a password manager and I generate them or do I have more accounts? What I'm trying to establish is, have we, have we come up with some construct which is reducing the number of passwords or the number of places we need to use passwords? And, and frankly, the answer to either of them is, is no, because we've got more than ever. Now the second part of the question, and this is sort of the more forward looking one, this is the second poll. So I've got two separate polls running here. Second poll is, I was curious as to people's projections for the future. And the question is, in 10 years from now, do you expect to have less passwords, same number of passwords or more passwords? 30% of people think that we will have less passwords. 9% of people think the same number. 61% of people, more passwords. I'm absolutely with the 61%. In 10 years from now, we will have more passwords from ever. There is absolutely no doubt whatsoever about it. And part of the reason is, is we're not gonna get rid of the ones we already have. How long is your tail of accounts and passwords now? The ones that you had 10 years ago, when I did that sort of retrospective poll, you will still have 10 years from now, unless you're proactively going through and actually getting your data removed from all these places, which very, very few people do. I certainly don't have time to do it. It's a pain in the ass. So, in 10 years from now, we should look back at this. <laughs> and I honestly think the results will be very, very same, very, very, very similar to when I asked about what about 10 years ago today. So, 
Anyway, have a look at the poll. I thought it was just an interesting little experiment to, uh, to see where people's sentiments lie. Now, uh, let me jump onto the big thing, because I've got to do this and then head off and actually go and try and play a little bit of tennis in the sunshine before I've got to do a little bit of snowboarding in the cold next week. Tough life. So, uh, sure bet. Holy shit. Oh, I'm just going to open the blog post and go through it in order. Um, I am receiving so much data lately, it is insane. Data, data, you know what I mean. Data. So much data, it's insane. So every single day, I receive data. Now, I either receive everything from, uh, sometimes people say, hey, uh, here's a website that just CC'd a whole bunch of people. Can you put it in, have I been pwned? It's like, no, you've got 50 email addresses on there. It might actually be a notifiable data breach, depending on where you're in the world. But no, I'm not going to put it in Have I Been Pwned. I get a lot of pace. So a lot of people send me links to things like a Spotify breach. I'm air quoting it for the people listening to it when it's really just credential stuffing. And then, of course, I get a lot of really big stuff as well. And at the moment, I'm getting a huge influx of big stuff that's taking me a long time to work through. I'm eyeballs deep in a whole bunch of disclosures at the moment. One of those disclosures was for a company called Surebet. Now, it's actually Surebet 24-7. I'm going to just abbreviate it to Surebet for the purposes of the rest of this uh, podcast here. Now, you may never have heard of that. It's a Nigerian betting site. I had never heard of it. <sighs> Let's touch on the Nigeria thing, because if I don't, it's going to come up in the comments anyway. Yes, we see a lot of Nigeria scams. There's obviously a whole bunch of dodgy stuff that comes out of there. I have no evidence to suggest that there's anything other than legitimacy in the way this site operates in terms of the legality of it. Uh, as some people have said, I, I don't know if it's run by a Nigerian prince who needs some money to help transfer the other money out. I have no evidence of that. Let's just give them the benefit of the doubt and say it's a legitimate legally operating service. It's, it certainly does seem to be. Anyway, someone uh, emails me the other day. So this was the 29th of December. And the title here is dumpssurebet247.com and more. They give me a URL to download a file. They give me a password for the zip. And a single word under that, enjoy. I'm not sure if enjoy accurately describes what I've gone through since this person sent that mail, this anonymous person on Proton Mail. It has certainly been a ride, let's just say that. So anyway, day after, I email Surebet. So I've gone through, I've done my own verification. I'll talk about how I did that verification later on. But I email them, title here, possible data breach of Surebet247. I email it to support at surebet247.com because that is their published support address. Uh, now you can go onto the blog post and read the email, but I try to establish some legitimacy. Uh, look, this is who I am. You can go here, read about me. I'm happy to send you the data. I just want you to know about it. And of course, I want my Have I Been Pwned subscribers to know about it. Now, just to sidetrack a little bit, this might even sidetrack off the chronology of the blog post. It wasn't just Surebet data in there. There are actually six files. There are five SQL Server database backups, and there was one .sql massive SQL script. They indicated different betting companies. The reason I focused on Surebet is because the title of the email that came to me said Surebet. So that was the context that I first understood when the data was sent to me. I was also able to verify the data pretty quickly on Surebet, so it was pretty clear that there was data in here which had come from Surebet. I needed a starting point, so that was it. Now I got a, an auto response very quickly, which came from the account, oh, hello Troy, your request, and there's a request number here, has been received and is being reviewed by our support staff. So okay, good, request received. Uh, it did go to junk. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's because it was from Nigeria or it was automated or whatever, but I dug it out of junk and, you know. Point is, they received the request. So, a couple of days later, no response. It's not unusual. And then, look, I'll be honest, different parts of the world, you sort of expect different levels of response. Uh, Australia, the UK, the US, I, I expect companies to be pretty responsive, especially when they're sort of mainstream commercially operating entities. Other parts of the world, like if it was China, I just simply don't expect a response. Uh, somewhere like Nigeria, I don't think I've dealt with the Nigerian data breach before. Now again, just to sort of touch on the Nigeria thing, I think my expectation was I was probably less likely to receive a response and for, her, for them to deal with it in a responsible way. But again, that might just be my preconceptions because, of course, of all the scammy stuff that comes from Nigeria. 
Anyway, I reached out to uh, Tifo Mahapi. Now, Tifo is a journalist in South Africa. I've worked with him before on the Master Deeds data breach. So this was that massive, massive breach which had basically everyone in South Africa on it uh, a few years ago. And this was a data aggregator who had sold the data to a real estate company. Real estate company left it publicly facing. Someone pulled it down. So Tifo has been a really good guy in terms of his ability to follow up and get answers from organisations. And this is what journalists do really well. This is why I use journos a lot. Because when they contact an organisation and go, hey, we're going to write a story about you in our news outlet, whatever it is, or whatever it is, he works for iAfrikan, is, is the name of the outlet. So when someone like Tifo reaches out and goes, we're going to write about you, do you want to make a comment? People sit up and pay attention. So anyway, he's, uh, he manages to get feedback from someone, dialogue, on Twitter DM with the Shorebet account. And <laughs> I'm just going just gonna to read this out. So he's chatting to Shorebet. I, I, uh, I've got some screen caps of the DM here with Tifo's permission. So Shorebet says, good day. We're working on the information you have provided. And Tifo's like, okay, when can we expect feedback, an answer or update? Note, as mentioned on the email, Troy has more info as well and can assist even more if you need to troubleshoot. And I want to be really clear here, like we made it crystal, crystal, crystal clear. We'll give them all the help we can. We'll give them the data. We'll try and connect them with the person who sent me the data. We'll do whatever we can to help you deal with this. I don't make money out of a data breach like that. He doesn't make money out of it. It's not that. This is not the reason we're doing it. We want to try and bring this stuff to light and get the organization to deal with it responsibly. Shorebet replies, okay, sir. It's very polite. So this was, uh, let's have a look. This was almost 24 hours later. This was about 23 hours later, 21 hours later. Tifo says, any update? Have your customers been notified of the possible security breach and data breach? Any comment? Five words, come back from Shorebet. That is ours to decide. Ooh, it's a little frosty. Uh, there's not a real good response. And, and really the, the, the point of this entire blog post was about how to, kids in the car mute this, how to completely fuck up your disclosure process royally fuck up your disclosure process. And this is where it really began to go downhill. So that is ours to decide. Now this is not a good way of responding to someone who is trying to help you and who also has control of the megaphone that forms the public narrative. Because that of course went straight into the article that Tifo subsequently wrote. Like he was like, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. Let's try and have a nice dialogue about it. But either way, we're gonna have dialogue and it's gonna go on the internet try and do this in a responsible fashion. They weren't real keen on the responsible fashion. So anyway, uh, we go on a little bit. Now, I, I do make a point in here. It does look like someone tried to shake them down for money. And so, it certainly wasn't TIFO, certainly wasn't me, but someone who had the data, maybe the person who sent it to me and, and, and subsequently connected with TIFO as well, maybe they're the one who tried to shake them down for data, or, or rather for money. This is not a good thing. This is a very illegal thing. This is a thing that you go to jail for in many parts of the world. So that is absolutely positively the wrong thing to do. That could well have got Shorebet well and truly off guard, uh, on the wrong foot, very suspicious of everyone. So uh, as I say here, I'll throw my bone for that. Totally understand them being a little bit nervy. That said, it takes, as I said here, like three minutes of Googling to figure out who Tifo is and who I am and that this is not, this is not our belly week. This is not the thing that we do. Uh, well, I mean, geez, Google my name and try and get a sense of how likely I am to try and be responsible versus shake you down for some Bitcoin. Anyway, so then, uh, then Shorebet goes all Streisand. And this is actually part of the title. Why did I title this blog post? I put a lot of th thought into my titles. The difficulty of disclosure, Shorebet 247 and the Streisand effect. Because what's happening now is they're just making the whole thing worse and worse and worse. So they tweet. This tweet is still up there as well. Kindly ignore the information going round about a hack into our system which has exposed your information with us. All sensitive private and financial information are stored on a secured server and protected by the best firewall to prevent intrusions. Thank you. Oh, they got a firewall. I should be right then. No problems. It's all behind the firewall. I feel that we have a firewall that is going to be something that, that appears in my presentations in the future. In fact, it might even appear. I've got to do my cyber broken presentation, which I do with Scott Helm. Uh, at the NDC events each year. And we've got to do that in a couple of weeks' time. I'm still writing it. So, uh, sure bet, I reckon you're going to feature in there. Not recorded either. You have to come along to an NDC to see a cyber break and talk. 
by Scott and I, you will understand why we don't record it if you see it. So this wasn't good, and, and there were some interesting responses to this. I've, I've uh, embedded a tweet here with one that just has the unbelievable bullshit sign flashing, which I think is a fair analogy of, of their comment. And I kind of gave some thought to, what do I do? And I, I was just gonna, I was just gonna throw them under the bus straight away, in so far as I was going to tweet a whole bunch of evidence, not disclosing anything personal or private or PII or anything like that, but I was gonna tweet a whole bunch of evidence publicly because they have now taken this narrative public. And, and again, that, like they wrote this following TIFO's story. Now keep in mind at this stage, they haven't seen the data that I have. They haven't heard anything about how I verified it. Even to date at the point of recording, they have still never ever contacted me or replied to me. So I thought, okay, look, I will, I'll take the high road on this one and I'll DM them the information instead. So what I did is I DM'd them, uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna read like the first sentence here and I'm gonna explain the other bits. Guys, this tweet is extremely misleading and is almost certainly false. So they're right off on the wrong foot. Now, I wanted to establish how I was very confident that the data was legitimate. And what I did is I sent them a couple of screen grabs of the password reset feature. Now, what you can do is you can take an email address from the alleged breach. I almost feel we can drop that word alleged now, but let's just humor me, say alleged. Alleged data breach, I can take an email address from there, I can go to their password reset feature, every email address that I put in the password reset feature results in a response that says, forgot password, please check your email for further instructions how to reset your password. Every email address I've fabricated, so I just fat finger it, comes back and says, error, provided email was not found in our database. Now, what do you reckon the chances are? What do you reckon the chances are that every single email address in the, air quotes, alleged breach actually exists on their system? What are the chances that they actually had a data breach? Pretty high. I go on. <laughs> they also have usernames on the system. Every single username I picked up from the breach already existed in the system. We know it does because by default, usernames have to be innumerable because you have to make sure that someone can't use a username that already exists. So you go to the registration page, you put in a username that exists. They've got a handy little API that's hit async from the client to come back and tell you whether the username exists already. Every single tested username exists. So each one of these is like a confidence building step in terms of establishing whether the breach is likely legit or not. So I send them all this via DM. And at the same time, I go and grab a handful of email addresses from, uh, from the Shorebet breach, which are also have I been paying subscribers. I've got almost 3 million subscribers now. I'm gonna tick over 3 million, I think in the next week. So there's always people in any sizable data breach who are my subscribers. And I emailed them and I said, hey, look, you asked to be notified if you're in a data breach. I think you are, I need your help verifying. And I asked them three questions. Number one, do you recall registering for the Shorebet 247 service? Number two, if so, approximately when did you register? Number three, to help confirm if the date of birth is correct, would you mind sharing what month you were born in? Because DOB was one of the fields in the database. Now, I don't want to just go out and say, hey, like, give me a birthday, because that sounds very fishy. I do want people to reply. If I ask them for the month, there's like a one in 12 chance of getting it right if they're guessing. Now, those odds stacked on top of the other things that I've already done in terms of verification seem pretty good for me. So I got a reply pretty quickly from a guy and the guy comes back and he's like, yes, I did use Shorebet and he gives me a date. Uh, this is the month I was born in. It lines up with the one that was in the system. I replied to him and said, this is your day of birth. Is this correct? Now by now, of course, he's realizing I'm gonna know what his full date of birth is anyway. And I also asked him where he lived because his name is Stefan. And I'm like, I've not been to Nigeria, but I never picture a lot of Stefans in Nigeria. And it wasn't clear to me at this time, is Shorebet something that just runs in Nigeria or is it a global service? The service, the website certainly looks like it's Nigerian. It looks like it's targeting a Nigerian audience. But anyway, he's like, oh yeah, Germany. So, like, wow, okay, that's interesting. You've got people from the EU at least one person, I know there's a bunch of others in there as well. Uh, but you've got people from the EU, so do we now get into that realm of GDPR as well? 
So that was interesting. The, the, other, the other data point here, and of course confirming that he did use the service, his date of birth is correct, remember confidence levels, right? This is a confidence building experience. Because when they're standing up there saying no, I've got to be more and more and more confident in order to say yes. Now the date he registered didn't line up. Because he said, where were we here? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, approximately when did you register? In Stefan's initial response, he advised that the first newsletter I found, so that the guy's actually saving newsletters, so oh, good on you, I guess it's, it's just digital, right? Approximately when did you register? Uh, the first newsletter I found is from the 13th of Feb 2014. Which is interesting because the registration date that I have on his record is the 19th of September 2016. I was like, this doesn't line up, but this is where it got interesting. He says, he actually got a notification that says on the 27th of September 2016, so this is eight days after his record shows registered, I got an email concerning migration challenges, telling me that all balances are secure. So maybe on the 19th of September 2016, they migrated to another platform and registered everyone per that date. And it's like, yeah, this actually lines up. In and of itself, as one single data point, this wouldn't be conclusive, but you add it to all the other things, and again, confidence building. Anyway, other people responded as well, and everyone's like, yep, it's all sure, but yes, I had an account there, yes, the dates line up, yes, the birth date's correct. <sighs> like, you just can't make this stuff up, right? Like, this is a breach of sure bet. I'm like 99.9% .9 confident. So I go back to my DMs, and I've been blocked. They literally blocked me. Now they've not even replied to the DM, still to this day not replied to it. They blocked me, they blocked Tifo, and then, like I tweeted this, and there's all these other people that have been blocked as well. And I've actually embedded every tweet here where someone's been blocked. How many have we got here where they blocked someone? So there's myself and Tifo, that's two, three, four, they blocked Scott Helm, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, 18 different screen grabs here. These are just the screen grabs. There are other people that tweeted and said I've been blocked. They didn't do a screen grab, so I didn't embed the tweet. And there's all these others who I'm sure are blocked and just didn't even realize it. So they're literally just going around trying to silence out every single bit of discussion about their breach. So I thought they should get some airtime, which is why the blog post was written. Now we've still not heard at the time of recording, which for me, where are we? We're going on 11.30. Here we go, play tennis in the moment, 11.30 on Friday morning, on the, on the 10th of June, Jan. Um, there is another really interesting point here, which uh, is from another story that Tifo wrote this morning, and I'll put this in my show notes for this uh, episode as well. I mentioned that there were multiple different betting agencies in there. A common thread that we found is a company called BTO Bet that seems to be the creators of a betting platform there are all these BTO bet email addresses in every single one of those six data breaches. Also, when I restored the SQL database, on the properties of the database, there were BTO bet people, staff, referenced in the permissions. So you've got BTO people in the ACLs, you've got BTO email addresses in the files. It's the one common thread. It's pretty likely BTO bet has been breached. Now Tifo's written about this today, he's had uh, responses I think from the PR people that talk about uh, BTO Bet notifying their customers. The way it reads at the moment is it's highly, highly likely that this is a data breach of BTO Bet and SureBet are sort of the victims of that data breach along with a bunch of other betting agencies. Now this in no way excuses SureBet's behaviour because surely the right thing for SureBet to do is go, holy shit, it looks like there's a data breach, we need to figure out what's going on because we need to protect our customers and our brand. So this is by no means a get out of jail free card for SureBet. But it does also mean that BTO Bet's got some pretty serious questions to answer. They're uh, apparently Macedonia based. Now I tweeted something about this before, it's like you've got Macedonia, uh, Nigeria, uh, uh, there's one of the services based in Uganda, I think another one is based in Malawi. It's like, it, it's not, I'm not trying to think of a way to say this without sounding derogatory because it's not the intention, but you know, again, it, it's not sort of um, modern Western countries where you expect things like uh, 
responsible behaviour when you try and disclose. Uh, for example, and I did a really good job of not sounding too derogatory there, but look, you know what I mean, okay? It's, it's a collection of organisations or a collection of countries where you'd expect things to be handled a little bit less efficiently and, and professionally than what you might in, say, this part of the world. And mind you, we've got plenty of problems here, that's another story. So look, we'll have to see how this pans out. I would really like to see BTO Bet just stand up and go, okay, this is what happened. Uh, and then organisations like Surebet have been, uh, un unfortunately, the victims of that, but also handled the thing really badly themselves. It's, look, this is just, I find this as a fascinating beginning to 2020 with data breaches. Certainly from the Surebet perspective, I'm pretty sure this is the worst handling of a data breach that I've ever seen. So, you know, they, uh, have they raised the bar or lowered the bar? They have reset the bar on that one. So, last thing on that, uh, let's, let's just close that one off. I'll update you if VTO bet comes clean or whatever it may be. Last thing is sponsorship wise. So Veronis is sponsoring my blog again this week. That would make them the first full week sponsor of 2020. So they have got their free video course, seven hidden Office 365 security settings. You can only unlock with PowerShell which is a very similar message to what they've had on my blog for a few weeks now. So big thank you for those guys. That's a free course. There's about five free courses from me on Veronis as well, which I've made for them in the past. So go check those out too. And a big thanks to Veronis for their ongoing support. Uh, hopefully we'll see a lot more of them in the future as well. So that's it from here. It's here. Well, it's here. It's done with the sunshine. I've got a couple of days before I will head back to Norway. So uh, next week is snowboarding week. So I'm going to be off with, uh, with my 10-year-old son who is coming snowboarding with me before he teaches kids to code at NDC Security in Oslo and then NDC London. I've plugged this before, I'm going to plug it next week. If you're in either Oslo or London and you have a child, bring them along, get them coding. We're going to have a lot of fun with this. Uh, it's a totally free event as well. So we'd, we'd love to see a bunch of people turn up for that. Thank you very much for watching this week. Uh, next week, I next week I will actually be in the snow fields. And in fact, next week, I should be able to do this for Scott Helm as well. So we'll do the Scott Helm Troy Hunt version of this. And we'll come to you from a very, very different setting to what this one is. Thanks for watching.